everything. All right. Okay. All right. Here we Let's go. Try it over. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a Thursday night. <laughs> Happy pre Halloween. And uh, this is such a fun discussion tonight, um, just in time for trick or treaters and for you guys to come over to the uh, to the club on Sunday for our spectacular Halloween celebration and dance. Can't wait to see everybody. I think I was talked into uh, taking pictures again. So I'm excited to see all your costumes. So uh, Nikki is back from cruising. He spent 49 days out on the sea and traveling all around the world. And uh, he's excited to talk to us about one of his favorite subjects this season, ghost ships and rogue waves. So thank you, Nikki, and you know everybody. Stay after, and we'll uh, um, we'll bombard him with questions. Well, thank you, Tammy, and thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. As Tammy mentioned, I just got home after a 49-day assignment in the Mediterranean, so it's kind of nice to walk around without the floor moving underneath my feet. Uh, it does take a few days to get used to it, but we've done a number of programs uh, with your group in the past where we focused on destinations. In August, we did the program on Rome. We were before that in St. Petersburg and Russia, other places that we've been. And these are programs that I do on the ship that are destination focused, different parts of the world that we're visiting and whether it's Antarctica or the Mediterranean or Alaska or wherever we might happen to be. This particular one I can do anywhere in the world because these phenomena that exist out on the oceans are all around the world. They're not confined to one area. And we thought it'd be interesting to look at it, especially this time of year, because in just a few days on Sunday, as a matter of fact, we all the little ghosts and the goblins and the witches and the, the creatures of Halloween. So this kind of fits into that. We're gonna talk about ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts? Is there such a thing as ghosts? What about ghost ships? Now, are people actually seeing vessels that they known to have sunk? Well, they just a type of, of exaggeration. And what about rogue waves? You've probably been on oceans that have been pretty ugly from time to time, but these are different. Rogue waves are certainly not figments of a sailor's imagination. They are actual phenomena that giant waves rise out of an otherwise normal ocean. Now we'll look at both of these and try to answer some questions. Now what we find in trying to answer these questions, we've got just about any access that you want to go through. Google has become a verb as well as a noun, it's a search engine. Any question that we want to get an answer to? What's the capital of Kazakhstan? How deep is the Marianas Trench, deepest part of the ocean? Well, we've got answers that we can get through Google. We can also go to these. These are the little echo dots, like Alexa. You can ask Alexa if you don't have a computer, just anything you want. How many electoral votes do we have here in the state of Alabama? How much rain are we going to get today? Is it going to rain this weekend? All types of questions we have answers to. So it's disturbing to find questions that we don't have answers to. And here, in our world today, ruled by science, technology, we've got instantaneous communications whether we're with it down in Antarctica or right here at home. The science medical breakthroughs that we find every single day, there's very little room today for myth, metaphor, magic. We've seen how many times people have walked on the moon even. But out on the oceans of the world, there's plenty of all three. All of these legends, all of these superstitions, all of these phenomena that are taking place that we cannot answer. One of those is ghosts. Are there ghosts in the world? Do you believe in ghosts? This photograph at the bottom was taken by a man who set up a video camera who claimed that every night he was visited by a spirit. Now, was that some kind of clever little ploy that he was working? Or is there some truth to that? We see people asking the question, is it possible to have contact with those who have gone on into the next world. There was an interesting survey that was done just last week. YouGov America asked 1,000 Americans, as a matter of fact, it was a week ago today, and they asked them a question. They said, do you believe that ghosts exist? Now, what do you think was answered? 400 people said yes. 41% of those surveyed said, yes, we do believe in ghosts. That's a higher number than I would have expected. And when they broke it down by men and women, it was almost one and a half many times more women than men thought that they had some kind of a ghost. Now, when they asked the second question, have you ever had contact with a ghost? Now that's a little bit more serious. Only about 20% said yes, they have been in contact with a spirit. 
Now, when we talk about a ghost ship, it's an apparition in a form of a vessel out on the ocean. It's a ghost, it's a ghost ship. Sometimes it's a sighting of a ship that's known to have, how can it have sunk and we've seen it? Is someone just trying to pull some kind of, of an elaborate hoax? Well, sometimes it's a battle action, a ship was destroyed, or in a violent storm like this one here portrayed at the bottom of Cape Horn. Sometimes it's what sailors call a derelict. That's a ship out on the ocean that's moving across the ocean, but then there's no crew on board. What happened to the crew? How is this ship moving without a crew? A lot of these great unanswered questions here. And there's some of these stories that you probably heard. This ship is the Mary Celeste, 1873, home port out of Staten Island, New York, bound for Genoa, Italy, with a cargo of $30,000 worth of industrial alcohol. Italy uses it to fortify some of their wines that they make. Making its way across the Atlantic Ocean, another ship came in contact with it and came alongside and hailed the captain. Well, they didn't see anybody on board. How is the ship moving? They sent a party on board. They found no one. There was no sign of pirate activity. All of the cargo was still intact. There were no bodies. There was no blood anywhere. The cat was sleeping on one of the, the little cargo areas. No one ever found what happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste. It was making its way by itself across the ocean. There's this story. We're going to go into this in detail in a moment. This is UB-65, a German submarine of World War I, said to be one of the most haunted ships in the world. There is this one, 1947, the Orang Medan. This ship was in Southeast Asia two years after World War II ended. And all of a sudden, the radio operator sent out a frantic mayday. He said, we die, we die, we die. So two ships, American flag vessels, came alongside, boarded the Orang Medan, and found all of the crew lying on the deck, and they were all dead, but there was no trauma. There was no blood. They were pointing skyward. What happened? They'll never know. Some time, a fire broke out, the ship was exploding, and the men who came on board to investigate it barely had time to get off before the ship went to the bottom with all, its, all of its uh, secrets. So what happened to the Orion Medan? We'll never know. And then the ship that everyone is familiar with, the Queen Mary, launched in 1936, became a troop ship carrying Americans to World War II in Europe. Well, it had a disastrous fire but when it, before it went out of service 30 years later, and a number of people were killed. Today, the ship is a museum piece in Long Beach, California. You go on there like it's a museum, and they still talk about the ghosts that are on there. Who are the ghosts? Supposedly the people that died still have frantic screaming that are heard by the museum docents. Now, are they just trying to sell tickets to the museum, or is there something actually going on? Even find wet footprints around the pool. Nobody's been in the pool for 30 years. Don't know. Here's a story that probably everyone has heard about, the Flying Dutchman. This is a, a true story of an actual 17th century merchantman operated by the Dutch East India Company. And this is one of the great trading empires of the Netherlands. In the 17th century, they pretty much had a monopoly on the treasures of the East, all of the routes to get there. To get there, you would go around the Straits of Magellan, the southern tip of South America, or the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa. And that's where Captain Vanderdecken in 1680 was making its way from the Netherlands down the coast of Africa to go around the bit of South Africa there into the Indian Ocean. Now, as he was doing this, if you go ever there to see this city, this is what it looks like today. That's Cape Town, South Africa. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world to sail into or to fly into. You see the city at the southern tip of the continent. The mountain in the back, as flat as a table, is aptly called Table Mountain. Now here is where three great oceans come together. The Atlantic, the Great Southern Ocean, the Antarctic Sea, and the Indian Ocean. Right there at the tip of the continent, and there is Table Mountain. Now the locals talk about a fog that often develops. They call it Table Cloth. You see it right sitting on top of the mountain. Now this is the reason, or could it be why, these locals talk about the strange things that happen in this fog, ships coming out of the fog. Now, the one that we're talking about is Captain Vanderdecken. This great storm was approaching. That's a good shot of electrical storm at sea, and that will put the fear into you. Now, all of the other ships at the time were making their way to port. They asked Captain Vanderdecken as they came by, are you making way for the captain tonight? 
Captain laughed at them. He said, are we not? He said, may I be eternally damned if I do, even though I beat around here till the day of judgment. You got to be a little bit careful when you make these boasts out on the ocean, who might be listening. It looks like the devil was listening on this one. The Dutchman was lashed by a savage storm and the ship, the captain and all hands were lost. It went down. People saw it sinking. Okay, the ship is lost. Why is it then that the devil is supposed to have told Captain Vanderdeck and for his arrogance, you and your crew are going to sail around the tip of this continent for all eternity? Could it be happening? Why is it that several people have sighted the ship? Have they actually seen the Flying Dutchman? Or is it something in the mist? Or is it just elaborate hoax that they're working? The first one is 1835. Ship's log would report that all of a sudden we saw the Flying Dutchman coming out of the mist on a collision course with us. Now, when you're in a situation like this, whether it's in a firefight in the army or out on the oceans of the world, People react differently. There's a man going to the guns, another man's crawling up the rigging, one man's falling down to pray. Well, they said just as the ship was about to collide with us, it mysteriously vanished just as mysteriously as it had appeared. Now, were they just imagining this? Look at what happened in 1881. This time, a Royal Naval vessel, British vessel HMS Bacante, the lookout reported flying, seeing the Flying Dutchman, and 11 of the crew confirmed the actual sighting. Now, what they put in the logbook was this. During the middle watch, the so-called Dutchman crossed our bow. She first appeared as a strange red light, as if a ship all aglow. He went on to write more. He said, our lookout man of the forecastle reported her close to our port bow, where also the officer of the watch from the bridge clearly saw her, as did our quarterdeck midshipman, who was sent forward at once to the forecastle to report back. On reaching there, no vestige, no sign of the ship was to be seen either near or away on the horizon. Now, sailors in those days got a daily allotment of grog. These guys may have been too much into the grog. But the midshipmen and the other officers confirmed the sighting. It became very bad luck for anyone to be the first person to report the sighting. And this happened here. The lookout who reported that sighting fell out of the rigging. His body was never recovered, sank like a stone. Now, who was the midshipman then who wrote that entry into the log? Could he have been a little too much into the grog? Not likely. That midshipman would be the later King of England, King George V. This is Queen Elizabeth's grandfather. He was in his sea trials at the time, learning to be a naval officer. Can't be ghosts though, can it? There's no such thing. Well, we would see it in 1923. Four sailors on a United States cargo vessel said, we saw the Flying Dutchman. Now, were they just making up a tale? I think the most interesting of the stories came just a few months before World War II began in Europe, March the 31st of 1939. Now, Glencairn Beach in South Africa is a very, very popular swimming area. All of a sudden, on March the 31st, 300 people who were in the water came racing out of the water and said, we just saw the Flying Dutchman. Now, was this just a tale? What happened was a man who was writing for the British South African Journal, the local newspaper, he said he saw it. Just as the excitement reached climax, the mystery ship vanished into thin air as strangely as it had come. And the interesting thing here is police interviewed these people and there were 300 of them. They interviewed, if you interview them all in a group, they'll say, Nikki, what did you see? Well, I'll describe it. All right, Tammy, what did you see? Yeah, well, pretty much what he said. Faye, what did you see? Well, yeah, what they were saying. But what they did was take each of these people individually and they all gave the exact same description of a Dutch East Indiaman of the 17th century. Now, unless you're an old blue water sailor, how would you know what a Dutch East India ship of the 17th century looked like? But they all described it exactly the same way. Pretty interesting. The last time it was spotted was in 1942 during World War II. Is it the Flying Dutchman? Is it still there? Well, we know it can't be because there's no such thing as ghosts, right? I don't know. Look at this one. UB-65, German submarine. Just prior to World War I breaking out in 1914, all the major powers of Europe were building the biggest ships, the biggest guns, the biggest armies in the world. Now, sailors are a very superstitious lot. UB-65 had some bad karma associated with it even before it went into the water. During the time it was being built, a construction accident led to two men being killed. Whoa, not a good sign. It would get worse. On its shakedown cruise, every ship goes into the water for what's called a shakedown cruise to see how it's operating. 
Well, one man was washed overboard, not a good sign. And then there is an explosion, unexplained, where the second officer of the ship is killed. Now there's a lot of bad karma on the ship. Well, World War II would break out in, uh, World War I, I'm sorry, in August of 1914. The ship would be going out into the North Sea and into the Atlantic Ocean to pick off Allied shipping. It's a German submarine. One day, the lookout burst into the captain's quarters. Now, this is something you do not do. On the hierarchy of a ship, you quickly learn there's the captain at the top, then under him is God, then everybody else under them. So you don't burst into the captain's quarters, but this man burst in, he said, we just saw the ghost of the second officer. Well, the captain said, well, that's impossible, the man died. Come with us. So the captain and the senior officers went with this lookout, and what did they see? They saw the ghost of the second officer standing on the vessel. Well, now they're really worried. The captain and the entire senior officer staff confirmed the sighting. So they weren't drinking, they weren't making up a story, they saw what they saw. Well, now nobody wants to sail on this ship. They bring it into port and they had a Commodore. This is a wartime rank in the Navy. German Navy had these people investigated, each of the captain and the senior officers. And he said, these people saw what they saw. Their stories have merit. Now, when you can't explain something, you look for all kinds of explanations, you can't find anything. Sometimes you turn to religion. Here is the white carnation of the Lutheran church, Church of Martin Luther. They brought in a Lutheran priest. He said, all right, we're gonna exercise the ship. We're gonna get rid of whatever demons or ghosts or whatever's on there. Well, they did that and it looked like it was working. By 1918, the ship was back out in the English Channel. It was looking for targets. They have a new captain and a new crew assigned on board. And for the next few months, things went pretty well. It did what U-boats do, picking off the ships, merchant ships, out in the Atlantic Ocean. Completed two entire tours, no ghost was spotted. Then on comes a new captain and a new crew. Bad timing, what happened? All of a sudden one day the lookout burst up top, screaming that the ghost of the second officer is chasing him, won't leave him alone. Well, he jumps overboard, his body sinks like a stone, never recovered. What was happening? Well, they don't know, they don't know. They found just four months almost to the day before the armistice was signed in November of 1918, an American vessel saw the UB-65 on the surface. What they do, they get ready to launch their torpedoes and their deck gun to go to battle stations. They're gonna sink the ship. Never had a chance. What happened? All of a sudden, there is a massive explosion on the German boat and it took everything to the bottom with it. No debris was found. Now I was in the army, I wasn't in the Navy, but I've been the on sea for 38 years. And I asked a man who's served 30 years in the Navy, I said, if a ship is lost in battle action or a storm or something, wouldn't you find some kind of debris, some kind of oil slick, even bodies showing up? He said, absolutely. There's always some kind of debris from a ship that's gone down. Here, there was absolutely none, zero. No trace of the vessel. So that's why UB-65 remains the great mystery, the haunted submarine. Is it the ghost of Lieutenant Richter? Can't be, there's no such thing as ghost, right? I don't know, look at this one. The USS Hornet. This is one of the most decorated vessels of the United States Navy in World War II. There were six vessels have tied, had the, the name USS Hornet. The first one was in the 1930s and it would serve in World War II. It would be the ship from which Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and 79 of his youthful flyers would launch 16 of the B-25 bombers off of this USS Hornet on their raid to Japan, April of 1942. A Couple months later, they're in the fight that turned tide of action in the Pacific, the Battle of Midway in June. We would see the same thing in the Guadalcanal battle, August. And then the last battle in, for this ship would be in the Santa Cruz Islands in October of 1942, when it was damaged so heavily by the Japanese Navy that the captain scuttled his vessel. Well, what's happening? Well, it is uh, also became a very popular ship when we watched in 1969, when they were the vessel that picked up the crew that had just landed on the moon for the first time. Hard to believe it's been since 1969, the moon landing. Now it is retired, the latest one, and it is a national landmark in Alameda, California. It's a museum piece. There are museum dozens to take you on a tour of the ship. Now, during the time the ship was at sea, 
in the war, 300 men died on it in battle action. Now, there are a number of unexplained sightings of people on the ship. Now, what can that possibly be? Well, the museum people say that we have seen officers and sailors in period 1940 dress coming on and coming off that ship. That's impossible. No, we've seen it. Now, are they just trying to sell tickets to get people to come on board? They've vanished when we approach them. They say, we also hear things and we see things. These are companionway doors that close off a ship to prevent it from flooding. They're opening and closing by themselves. Who's opening and closing these? Don't know. How come we hear footsteps and we hear voices? We'll go to investigate and no one is there. Well, the electronic equipment that hasn't operated in 32 years is all of a sudden turning itself on and turning itself off. And something actually happening here, or these just tales. Well, the United States Navy, just like the German Navy, they sent in an investigative crew along with psychics and said, these people are actually hearing and seeing what they're seeing. There's something to them. I think the strangest case is this man. This was the captain of the USS Hornet during World War II. He retired as a rear admiral. His name was Joseph James Clark. He was, matter of fact, the very first Native American to graduate from Annapolis, the Naval Academy. Now, he is often seen coming and leaving his ship, and that's not unusual. Down in Mobile, Alabama, our port city, we have the USS Alabama in there, a battleship, and many times the men who served on it in World War II will come back and forth to show their families what they were serving. Now, he's often seen entering and leaving his ship, but the problem is he died in 1983. Hmm, a little bit strange, a little bit strange. No such thing as ghosts, right? So it can't be as ghosts. It's part of the great mysteries of these oceans. We know so much more about our solar system than we actually know about the oceans of the world. We've sent satellites up, we've sent satellites out of our entire solar system to the edge of darkest space. We've walked on the, time, on the moon so many times that we don't remember the name of the last man. We remember Neil Armstrong was first, but who was the last man who walked on the moon? We have sent a rover to Mars to scoop up samples of the soil to see if life could ever have existed on Mars. We had an interesting thing happen with this man, Felix Baumgartner. He decided he was gonna break the speed of sound by himself. He had a satellite carrying him up 120,000 feet above the surface of the earth and he jumped. He finally hits the sound barrier and he broke it and he actually survived. So all this is happening in space. We saw this astronaut the very first time someone would vote from outer space, voted in the election. And she did, very first one. We've seen the Webb telescope replace the old Hubble. This has gone out of space even further than the others and taken some just unbelievably great photographs of our planets and our solar system. We saw Captain Kirk go into space just earlier this month, 90 years old. Captain Kirk from the old Starship Enterprise and his crew blasted off out of uh, their little station and returned to Earth 45 minutes later. The oldest man to ever have gone into space. So we're doing all of this in space. We were gonna be looking here in another year at the giant balloon, 400 feet wide. The asteroid is gonna go up there 62 miles above the surface of the Earth to take pictures. We know so much about our solar system. But on the world's oceans, we know less than 5% have been actually explored. And most of them by these giant deep sea bathyscaphs and underwater submersibles. Look how, what, what they're finding. They found that the deepest point in the world is over here in the Marianas Trench, just from up here in Japan, runs about 1,580 miles. And it goes down almost seven miles deep. Nobody's been that far. We get close to it. There was a man just a couple of years ago who had a specially designed craft that took him about 35,800 feet down. Still not on the bottom, but what he saw was incredible. How much more is there to learn about what we see at these depths? The little bath scout would take pictures of actual plants growing down there. We don't know what they are. And look at some of the fish. It's so dark down there that this fish carries its own light to find its prey. Look at the dental work on this guy. He's got some kind of teeth you don't want to see. They've also found a fish that they've never seen before. It is pure black, ultra black it's called. It's a fierce looking face, but it's got its own little light that carries with it. 
So all of these are unanswered questions, but we're starting to get answers from the ocean. Biomedical research. They found that certain types of sponges have a chemical that is very effective in treating some types of cancers. How many more we're gonna find? They found different corals that produce antibacterial agents that are much more powerful than morphine, but do not have the addictive qualities of morphine. How much can we learn from what's down in the ocean? Chemicals in certain jellyfish have been used to treat different people with Alzheimer's, dementia, improving brain function from just a simple jellyfish. We had this vessel that spent four years up in Greenland. And what did they come back with? 195,000 new viruses that had never ever been discovered before. So it's just, we don't know how many unanswered questions now in below the surface of the ski with these great oceans of the world. And that begs this one, what's as tall as a small office building can snap a vessel in half. And it's this, these monster waves, giant waves. What it does is inspire a small group of people and they are masochists to hop on a piece of fiberglass and launch themselves into this. Those are 60 and 70 foot waves that are normal at different times of year in Hawaii, South Africa, and places off the coast of Europe. These aren't rogue waves. These are seasonal waves. They're giant, they're monsters. Where are they coming from? This guy on the left looks like he's about to dive. It's just posing for a photograph. Ever since there's been people looking at the ocean, they've been fascinated by these giant waves, these sea monsters, they call them. What's going on here? Can there be a 100 foot wave? If you're interested in further study here, there's a woman named Susan Casey, and she wrote a book called The Wave. She said, according to basic physics of ocean science waves, the conditions that would produce a 100 footer are so far beyond rare that they virtually never happen. Yet they do, they do. Are there actually 100 footers? Again, they're not these seasonal giants. This is why Mia Bay in Hawaii on the North shore of the island of Oahu. Now these guys are going out as professional surfers in 30, 35, 40 foot waves. The Banzai pipe, look at the water this guy's out trying to outrun. Professional surfers, they do the same thing in South Africa. There at the tip of the continent, there's some monster waves that build up every winter, which is there June, July, and August below the equator. We see these Australians doing the same thing, surfing competition with regular waves in their winter, again, June, July, and August. And look what's behind this guy. He's got a whole school of bottlenose dolphins riding the wave right along with him. The monsters that they found the largest in the world are over here in Portugal. That doesn't seem like it. You've got a nice, sandy, quiet beach here. But on the other side of the country, right on the Atlantic Ocean, a man named Garrett McNamara. This guy was from Hawaii. He was an American. A few years ago, he rode a 78 foot wave, the largest one ever recorded. And then just more recently, his record was eclipsed. A man in November of 2017 from Rio de Janeiro, Rodrigo Corsa, rode an 80 foot monster. But again, these aren't rogue waves. These are normal at different times of year. I asked a professional surfer when I was researching this show, I said, what do you think about when you see monster waves 30, 40 feet high? He said, we don't measure them in feet and inches. We measure them in increments of fear. I love that. Increments of fear. And you would think, think of the tons of water that are about to come down on this guy if he doesn't outrace that one. But these are seasonal waves. This is something different too. The tsunamis that we see after an undersea earthquake. You might remember the one in 2004. Hard to believe it's been 17 years from that one. Killed almost a quarter of a million people when from its epicenter right there in Indonesia, we had these big waves go all the way across the Indian Ocean to the coast of Africa and up into the Bay of Bengal. Now we would see more recently, just 10 years ago, a 9.0 earthquake underwater in Japan. And there we would see the electrical grid knocked out for days. They're still trying to put some of that together. 150,000 people evacuated from this area where the tsunami hit. Radioactive water still being released there. The most powerful earthquake in Japan's history. How many? 28,000 are dead and still many, many missing. But again, this is something that happens as a result of an earthquake. It's not a rogue. Rogues are entirely different. There are just monster waves riding out, as you see here, of a normal ocean. 
The normal doesn't have to be flat. It can be a 10, 20, 30 foot C, but then all of a sudden there's a 100 foot wave within that. Why is that happening? How is it happening? We don't know. It's the least understood of all these phenomena in the ocean. Rising out, of, you hope it's like these guys, they're about to hit a monster wave, but they're going to hit it bow on. You want to hit it from the side. And there's absolutely nothing you can do. When you see it, you're going to be scared. You just hope you bow on into it. Now we can see it approaching. We can measure its speed with radar, but you can't predict them. There's no way to predict when and where they're going to hit. Now, for a long time, people thought these were just tales of sailors like flying fish. Flying fish, absolutely. Matter of fact, in your area, just uh, Florida in the Caribbean is one of the most popular areas for seeing flying fish. And they're very good to eat. The little pectoral fins that they have that act as little bits of, of wings when they're trying to outrun a predator. Sailors came back with stories of monster bits, giant squid, other sea monsters just entirely grabbing a whale or a ship. Well, they came back from these hundreds of years ago, but we found now that these things actually exist. They're not exaggerations, just as the rogue waves are. USA Today, New York Times, CS, they are a common sight on satellites. They could certainly record them. New York Times said they're huge, they're freakish, but they are absolutely real. Is there something how they have begun confirming these sites? And the scary thing is they are much more common than we once thought they were. How bad is that? This is a super tanker that's loaded with oil coming off the North Slope of Alaska, leaving from Valdez, Alaska. These are 250,000 ton ships. Now think of it in perspective of how big that is. The largest naval vessel is a Nimitz class carrier in the Navy today. This is 250,000 tons. The Nimitz class carrier is 97,000 tons. This is three times the size of an aircraft carrier. Monsters. And over 20 of them have been lost in the last 20 years from rogue waves. They're low to the water, so all it takes is a rogue wave to smack it and it'll just break it in two. 20 of them have been lost in the last 20 years. A man named Wolfgang Rosenthal, he leads a group called the Max Wave Project. He said, we'll leave two large ships sinking every week on average worldwide, but it's never studied to the same detail as an airline crash. It gets put down to bad weather. Can you imagine if we had an airline crashing twice a week all through the year? That would be unacceptable. This is acceptable loss in the, in the sea. It's unacceptable on land. You can't think of these planes going down twice a week with the three and 400 people that are on them to all of a sudden be lost. We're still talking about what happened here seven years ago. 239 passengers lost, still haven't been found, and it's still making headlines around the world as we're talking about the Malaysia Airlines plane that vanished. 1995, it would be on January the 1st, New Year's Day, when the existence of these rogues was very first concerned, and that was in the North Sea. The North Sea is where I worked at, on the oil rigs, and we saw some pretty awful weather sometimes on the ships the same way. Area of ferocious storm. Think about seeing this coming your way. Captain, you better come over here and have a look at this. We've got a storm on the horizon. Calamitous seas, you don't want to be on this ship. That is pretty ugly water when you've got the blue water over the bow, it's called. Bow sinking beneath the waves. This is in England, a National Geographic photograph of a monster wave just about to hit the Shoreham Lighthouse from the southern coast of England. Many times our rigs like this one would have to be shut down and we were evacuated because of these storms out in the North Sea. In an oil rig like this, Dropner platform is where they recorded the one. And there you see what they're doing. Those two derricks are going down inside, deep inside the earth to bring out oil. This is a pretty nice day on the North Sea. Calm, you can ski out there. The fire that you see is what's called a burn off. As you get deeper into the earth, they're burning off the natural gas that you encounter. Now, while that's a good day on the North Sea, that's a bad day. They told us here, you're gonna be evacuated. We gotta get out of here, this is tearing the rig apart. I said, well, they can't fly the helicopters in this kind of weather. How are they gonna bring us home? Uh, not to worry, they're gonna send the tenders. So there you got a little ride on the tender boat of 30 and 40 foot seas. That's when you wish you listened to my mother and she told me not to do this kind of foolishness. But what they've done is to mount these laser-based wave height detectors on the rig floor and on the ocean floor to measure the speed of these waves coming along. 
and the monster waves, the rogue that's within them. And here's what happened on New Year's Day of 1995. They had a pretty good sea running. It was about four meters, about 12 or 14 feet. But this would be a wave that changed history. What happened? Rising out of this 12, 13 foot sea was a 36 meter, that's 120 feet. And it was traveling at 45 miles an hour. Now in each of our rigs, we had a geologist and he has a reading of what he's seeing. And that's the ocean, this 36 meter wave in about a, a four, five, six meter sea. So you see that little hiccup right there in the middle. It's just not supposed to happen. I asked the geologist, I said, what is it? He said, we don't know. It's not supposed to exist. You got a normal ocean, and there you got a 120 foot sea riding out of a 100 foot, out of a 10 foot ocean. It happened in 1933 for this ship, and they were very lucky to have survived it. It's an oil tanker in the naval vessel of the United States, USS Ramapo. Now, it's very low to the water. They get in a terrible storm, 40 foot seas. All of a sudden, there's a wave 112 feet high that they triangulated from the crest to the trough. Didn't break them apart. The Queen Mary, we talked about a minute ago, is a haunted ship. Look what it survived when it was carrying troops in World War II. 1942, they got hit by a rogue wave in the North Atlantic. They were about 600 miles off the coast of Scotland. Now, the captain talked about this afterwards. He said, it's just not our time to die. It just was not our time to die. What happened? He said, we listed 52 degrees after being hit by a 92-foot wave. Now, I don't know if you can imagine a 52-degree list. A five degree list, the ship, you're holding on to something. If it's 10 or 15 degrees, the liquor cabinet comes open, everything crashes out, the party's over. 52 degrees, the ship went over on its side and righted itself right back up. Again, the captain said it just wasn't our time to die. 1972, another tanker coming from Singapore bound for Portland, Oregon. They were in a six, six foot sea, six feet high. All of a sudden there's a 72 foot road wave in a six foot sea not supposed to happen. Look at this one. This is the flagship of one of the largest cargo lines in the world, Hapag Lloyd, a German crew. Now they're out in a storm, but they're supposed to be designed to withstand just about anything that mother nature can throw. All the latest bells and whistles on this 850 foot cargo ship. Well, in December of 1978, they were here in the Azores, just off the coast of Portugal. They issued a distress call. We have just suffered damage from a monstrous wave. How big was it? They don't know. They'll never know because the ship and all hands were lost. Now, until the Malaysian airline disaster, this was the largest sea rescue operation ever launched. 13 aircraft and 110 ships tried to find out what happened to it. No one ever did. The wave was so big, it said something extraordinary destroyed the ship. We'll look at what the, many Canadians are familiar with. About 170 miles off the coast of St. John's in Newfoundland was one of their rigs operating in the Atlantic Ocean. It's called the Ocean Ranger. Now, those of you from Canada probably remember what happened here. These guys were built to withstand just about anything Mother Nature could throw at you. They were built to withstand 110 foot seas and hurricane force winds. And that sounds pretty good. They said, this is the indestructible rig. Well, you better remember when you're making these boats out on the ocean, who might be listening? They got hit by a rogue wave and that's what happened to it. 1982, what began as a rescue operation turned into a recovery operation. All 84 men on that rig died when that rogue wave hit them. Their book's been written about it. The Canadian Broadcasting Company had a special on television about it, world premiere. What about this, the, the QE2? Queen Elizabeth, another one of the great transatlantic liners. This one was hit not by one, but two rogue waves consecutively in 1995. And look what happened here. They were bound on into this storm and all of a sudden out of a 20 foot sea comes two 95 foot waves. The captain wrote about it in his log. He said, and by the way, what a great picture this guy. It looks like the old British salt, doesn't he? With the great uniform, the beard. Captain Ronald Warwick said it came out of the darkness from about 220 degrees, looked like the white cliffs of Dover. Broke over the bow with explosive force and fell into the trough in between the waves, smashing windows and a portion of the fort. They were lucky. They were very lucky. What about in an enclosed sea like the Mediterranean? Yep, they caught one here. 
the entire bit of the bow underwater. You see the power of the waves. Look at this, just peel this structural steel back, looks like it's cardboard. You say, wow, how powerful is this ocean? If it hits you from the side, from the beam, you're going right over. You hope that if it hits, that you will bow on into it, like these guys are, riding straight into it. I asked the marine engineer, I said, how powerful does a wave have to be to dent a structural steel ship? He said, it takes 30 tons of water per square meter to dent something like that. If you have a 100 foot wave, look how much you have, 100 tons per square meter. You can see what it would do to a ship. And people often ask me, okay, tell me where these rogues are and we're gonna stay out of those waters. Well, you'd have to stay home. They are in all the oceans of the world, but I'll show you where the three most popular spots, or as you might say, the worst popular spots are. One of them is up here in the North Sea in an area called the Rockall Trough. Other one down here at the Alaska, an area that we often visit, and then the bottom of Africa around Cape Town. Let's look at each of these. This is the Rockall Trough. This is a bit of uh, ocean that's in between Scotland, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland. And there things happen, anything bad that can happen is happening there. The Rock Hall Trough has what they call some interesting bathymetry. What is bathymetry? Bathymetry is the landscape under the water, just as we have landscape over the water. Yeah, the picture shows you bathymetry. There are canyons, there are mountains, there are floor of the ocean. There you also have different currents and on, on the surface you have different winds blowing. Now these are tectonic plates. These black lines are all around the world. Geologists say these black lines, these tectonic plates, are constantly colliding with one another. It's what causes an earthquake, the collision of these plates. It's called the process of subduction. One of the plates is gonna go higher, one is gonna go lower, you have an earthquake. You see right there at the Rock Hall Trough, a perfect area where these different tectonic plates are colliding with each other, right there. So you've got that bad going on. You've also got this. The Florida Gulf Stream begins where you are down in Florida, flows across North America and then into this North Atlantic drift. It's a, it's a river within the ocean is what it is. And it's very warm water. Look at that red water coming up from Florida all the way across the Atlantic. And where you see it goes above the dotted line, the Arctic Circle. That's why in Norway, we were able to drill in wintertime. When you go to the left, look at the Labrador current, everything's frozen solid. So you've got this rock called trough. You've got the currents. You've got this warm water. You've got the tectonic plates. 1,000 ships have met their death right there in that particular part of the ocean. Don't want to be there. How about over here in Alaska, Latuya Bay? There's a panhandle of Alaska, very popular route for cruise ships going up from Vancouver all the way up into Alaska. When you're going into Glacier Bay National Park, Latuya Bay is just above that. And geologists call it the mystery of Latuya Bay. Now, it wasn't a mystery to the native people. For thousands of years, the Clinkets had been living there, and it was very good fishing water, but they knew they were dangerous. When the Europeans arrived, they told them about what's there. Now, the very first Europeans was this man. Vitus Bering was from Denmark. He was in the service of the emperor of Russia. Tsar Peter I commissioned Vitus Bering and a Russian, Alexei Cherikov, to go to Alaska. I want you to explore the coast. There's new Europeans there. We're going to claim it for Russia. And they did. They did. Native people were there, but there were no Europeans. Well, these guys were exploring that coast, and they do what captains do when they come into a bay. You anchor your ship out of the bay, you lower the small boats, and tell them, go in there and see what kind of anchorage we have inside the bay. It came in in 1741. Well, the first boat that they lowered went in, and all of a sudden, a monster wave just grabbed them and swallowed them. Whoa. The captain's thinking, well, let's do it again. Now, how would you like to be the second six guys they lowered into a boat? They said, now, you guys just saw what happened going in there and find us a good anchorage. Well, the second boat got swallowed by another monster wave. Now we see what's going on here. The native people said, this is one bad area. They have had 14 of their canoes swallowed by rogue waves in this little bay. Why? It's a perfect spot for pumping out these monster waves. This is what happened in 1899 during the gold rush. People up there looking for gold, all of a sudden they had these 100 foot 
possibly a 200 foot wave. Can that be? They said, well, it had to be. He said, we just left our tents and ran for the hills. The one man that they found, the only part of him they found was his hat, one mile inland. Could it have been a monster wave like that? The area is perfect for pumping out these waves, geologists tell us, because here on the left-hand side, the cliffs are about 500 meters, that's about 1,600 feet high. On the right-hand side, 900 meters, that's about 2,700 feet high. So you have a very narrow entrance, you have very high cliffs on both sides, and maybe that's why they're pumping out these monster waves. They also have a pretty powerful current, 15 knots in a very narrow entrance. Maybe that's what's happening. When we go there today, we have kayak trips that we take a group in. You don't wanna stay there too long. We'll go there long enough to read the little monument that's on there. It said, reader, whoever you are, mingle your tears with ours for the people who lost rogue waves here at Tia Bay. The last one, and we'll close with this one. This is the tip of South Africa. What's happening here? Well, again, anything bad that can happen is happening. You've got three oceans coming together. The great warm water from the Agulhas Current coming out of the Indian Ocean, icy cold water coming up from Antarctica in the Southern Ocean, and lukewarm water coming over here from the Atlantic Ocean. So you've got all these intermingling of waters. This is what it looks like in a thermal imaging map. You've got very hot water, warm water, cool water, and cold water. In addition, from those three oceans coming together, you've got just a maelstrom of different currents that they're battling. So it's not just Cape Horn in South America. Cape Town, South Africa can be one ugly place. You see sips like this, just encountering some terrible storms. They're just pretty much underwater. You don't want to be on this ship. Now, the very first European to go around that area was Bartholomew Dias. He was a Portuguese. No European had been down below the equator and none had been around the tip of South Africa. Dias was trying to do that and he made it, but it was quite by accident. He was blown around the tip of the continent in a great storm. Now, again, when you have these storms, people react different ways. Some are praying, some are running to scramble to take in, so whatever. But they survived it. They got back around the tip and made their way back to Portugal to report to King John. And they said, we made it around the tip of the continent. We have found a route to the Indies for our sailors, but it is one horrible ocean. He called it Cabo das Tormentos, Portuguese for Cape of Storms. Now, King John is a pretty smart man. He's thinking, I'll never get my mariners to go down there if there's a terrible name like that. Let's give it a better name. So what do we know it as today? Cape of Good Hope. A great chamber of commerce marketing ploy by King John, 1482. Is the Flying Dutchman still down there in those terrible waters? Is it the ghost ship? Is there such a thing as ghosts? Well, we know there's no such thing, right? Is the Flying Dutchman there? We don't know. We leave you to decide, is there such a thing as ghosts, ghost ships? And certainly there is a, such a thing as rogue waves. So are these just unexplained phenomena that we don't have answers to that what's trouble us? We like to have answers to everything. Here in the oceans of the world, we do not. Now I'd like to throw it open for any questions that you might have that I'll try to answer for you. We stopped the screen right, sharing. I've unmuted. Um, we've unshared the screen. Now I could take a poll and see if anybody uh, believes in ghosts and rogue waves. <laughs> but uh, hey, do you think um, climate? Do you think the climate change and stuff has a lot to do with? There many reports have been written about the effects of weather now uh, with climate change. We find it much more warming waters. Well, that produces a, a difference in the temperature of the water as to the salinity. How salty is this part of the ocean? How salty is that part of the ocean? Uh, that certainly affects the ships. Uh, climate change in the uh, more frequent storms that we find today. Uh, fires on land, storms at sea. They find this is really taking place and they can't explain it, but they do feel that climate change is certainly a part of that. It's even affecting the animals. They're finding the penguins that are going even more further south than they are in Antarctica and polar bears up in the Arctic. They're having a time because some of the ice that's melting there, you know, it's, it's habitat for polar bears. So it's not affecting just the ships out there with more storms, more powerful storms, but certainly the creatures in the ocean as well. 
Um, now, the difference between, so you have a rogue wave and you have a tsunami. Now, can a rogue wave turn into a tsunami or? Okay. Tsunami is the, is the title of the wave. The name of the wave is called when there is a volcanic explosion or an undersea earthquake, it creates a tsunami. And the tsunami is the result of that action. Rogue wave is not a result of anything. It just shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, the man told me, he said, it's a hiccup in the ocean. Not supposed mm -hmm. to be there. You've got an otherwise normal sea. Normal might be 10, 20, 30, 50 feet. And all of a sudden there's a 100 foot wave. It's the rogue that's just coming out of that normal sea. It's really a-, a um, We, it, we it, have a question no, from- uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Who has the question? Me. Yes, Mrs. Irona. Yes, Irona. I, I asked the question is that, have any of these wrecks been found of the shipwrecks? Uh, they, the, the ones that have vanished, they have like the UB-65, the Flying Dutchman, the, the uh, other programs that, that we mentioned there, that these ships, they haven't found anything. And that's what's so strange and makes them think it's something paranormal going on because these people who spent their lives at sea tell you, you're going to find something after a ship sinks or after there's naval action. I mean, they found the Titanic now, as deep as it is. How come they can't find some of these others in much shallower water? There's another show that I'll do if you like to watch it at some time, it's on the Bermuda Triangle. There's been over hundred ships and about 50 aircraft that have vanished in that area. You don't vanish something. It's gonna find some remains of a plane or a ship. What's going on there? Don't know. It's the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. That's why I didn't include it in this show because it's a standalone show. There's so many mysteries there that you can't cover it in just a short period of time where we're doing this one with the rogue waves and the, um, the ghost ships. But they have Mr. found- Robinson, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, I was wondering, because uh, I don't believe in ghosts, <laughs> some of these rogue waves I could understand with climate change and like, but what? What were the demographics of those thousand people that were asked about, do you believe in ghosts? And 41% said that they did. Uh, were they, you know, in big cities? Were they small towns, different countries? So that's kind of my curiosity. This is how they broke it down. And I'd love to see uh, what the age groups were, but they didn't, uh, you know, uh, submit that when they had this. 1,000 people is what they showed. And the overwhelming number, 50% of women, 31% of men, uh, were made up in that group of 41% that said, yes, we believe ghosts exist. Uh, I'd love, like you, to see what age group they were. Um, what I've read in other stories and other surveys is that it's usually a younger population. And I'm 74. I would have thought, well, maybe people my age are more likely to encounter a ghost or to believe in a ghost. Or that may be very religious people. That's what I was wondering, you know, where in the world, what countries, what, what the like, uh, probably the more religious people probably do than those that aren't. But I, like I said, it was just a curious question. There's uh, another uh, survey that I understand is going to come out that's going to really break it down. In which religious group are you? Uh, Christian, Jewish, uh, Muslim, whatever, and just see the demographics of that. How many? Right. I think there'd be differences based upon the the religion and and where where in the world uh, and whether they were developed countries or or third world countries and the like. When I see that, I'm going to bring it to your attention because I think it's a fascinating thing. And people with no faith at all are they, you know, included in that? of the different people that uh, profess to a certain faith, those no faith, um, what, what is the breakdown? So I'll, I'm anxious to see when that does come out and I'll certainly share it with you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Cavanaugh? Uh, the, they seem to be constructing much larger um, container ships. And, you know, how is that affected? You know, what are they taking into consideration? Can they survive these things? And also second, it, what about the military uh, ships? You know the, you know the current versions of aircraft carriers and things like that. Can they survive any of those road waves? They, they can and they do. What's happening now? I'll answer that first bit of the question there on the container ships. With the new construction in the Panama Canal, the ships that were allowed to go through there in the old, uh, before the new construction, were about five thousand containers that they could carry. 
Now they've got new locks and a new approach channel there that we go through. And the new size ship is up to 15,000 containers. Now that's just a monster vessel. It's as big as these that you saw, the 220, 230,000. There are cruise ships that are that large. Royal Caribbean next year will have the largest one in the world. They can't go through the Panama Canal. They have to go all the way around the tip of South America. Now those actually are better survived. They can roll better than a, a vessel like these uh, tankers. They're low on the water, they don't roll. But the larger ones that have these containers, they will roll. They may lose a lot of those containers. I can't, I can't imagine how they saved any of them on a 52 degree list of the Queen Mary, the passenger mm -hmm. ship. But to write itself after a 52 degree list is just almost unheard of. They would lose a lot, if not all of their containers, but they would bounce back up. Those tanker ships that you had, whether they are US naval vessels or the commercial ships, they're just gonna break in half. They're gonna break in half. So they wouldn't ride it as well. Uh, and it would depend too on if the car to bow on or if it came from the beam from the side. From the side, I don't see how it could not just flip the vessel completely. Remember the movie, The Poseidon Adventure, flipped it right over, it was upside down. Well, that, that has happened. And they do the rescue from the hole, from the uh, bottom, drilling down to get the people out, you know, that way. So it, it raises so many more questions for people who are designing, you know, ships today, how large those ships can be. Do you want it to be able to go through the canal? Do you want a better ride for your ship? And they're certainly taking that into consideration for cruise vessels, you know, as opposed to a cargo ship. We lived in Savannah and, you know, the container ships would come up the channel, you know, you're just a few feet from them when you're down, you know, having dinner on River Street and they go up to the port, but they're dredging, dredging the channel so, mm -hmm. it's a, so that the, uh, the largest ships could go up there. And just when you're seeing them that's so close, you know, you just can't imagine them getting hit by one of these waves and surviving. Exactly. The last cruise that I did in 2019 before, as a matter of fact, it was in January of 2020, before the industry shut down, we were fending up in Savannah. had come down from Quebec along the, the Maritimes of Canada and then the east coast of the United States. And across the harbor from where we were was the container port where an aircraft carrier was. And you see the monstrous size of that thing, 97,000 tons. And you think, well, what about a 250,000 ton ship, three times the size of a carrier? It's just, uh, un until you see one, it's almost hard to fathom how big it actually is. All right. Well, yes, can I ask one more question? Only because you mentioned Royal Caribbean. The, their largest ships are about 233,000 tons. They have stabilizer bars and they also have water that moves in and out of the uh, underneath of the hull to stabilize the ship. If there was if there was ever a rogue wave, what would your opinion be as to whether that ship would uh, survive and be okay? I'm still going to go on them, but I'm just I'm just curious because they're monster they're monster ships. You, you feel less you feel less. Um, of bumps and, and things and you do driving on I-95 in your car. So I'm just curious to, about that since you did mention Royal Caribbean, so. Yes, we have those stabilizers even on the cruise ships. They're big right. nice and they make for a much more comfortable ride as well if you're in a, in a bumpy ocean. Um, if it hits you from the side though, that stabilizer, not, it bow on again, you hope you're gonna be that way. And stabilizer, that's when we're going down to Antarctica. Some of the worst water in the world is that Drake Passage. And if you're on an expedition ship, they might be 12, 15,000 tons. You're gonna get a pretty ugly ride. The big ships, 200,000, 150,000, and nothing in the water, going in the water these days, you know, less than that. All the cruise ships are larger, except for the small expedition ships. So that's why many people choose the larger one to get a smoother ride if they're going into certain oceans like the North Sea, the Labrador Sea, or down in Antarctica. Um, those stabilizers really make a, a, a tremendous difference. A tremendous difference. So as much as you travel, Nikki, um, have you encountered any phenomenon? And do you know anybody that has claimed? I've not been in a rogue wave. We've been in some horrible seas. Uh, up in Greenland, one of our North Atlantic crossings, once we had a pretty much four days of a 40 foot sea. Dining room is empty, nobody's there. The crew is sick, the guests are sick. It's a, it can be an ugly ride. Same thing down in Antarctica. The Drake Passage, I've been around Cape Horn 17 times. Sometimes it's a smooth 
as the floor or the times you have a 30 foot sea running. You never know what's going to happen. So I've never seen a rogue, never seen a rogue wave, never been hit by a rogue. I've talked to people who were on that QE2 in 1995. And they said that was just an, a, an incredible experience. One lady said, who were on it, said, I'll never get on a ship again. Uh, others said, you, we will. It's just a very unusual and rare occurrence but it's not as rare as we thought. As you saw, 20 super tankers lost in 20 years. That's a lot. If those were aircraft that were lost that frequent, you'd have all kind of, of, of coverage for the news media, but they're ships and you don't have that much. So I'll knock on wood that I haven't seen uh, any of these uh, rogue waves and hope I don't. One thing that I mentioned though, this program that we do, I mentioned we can do it in any oceans of the world. If we're in, in Alaska, if we're in doing the Med, if we're in doing the North Sea, if we're in Asia, if we're in whatever, I'll do this one uh, in addition to the local shows that we do. But we always do this one at the end. You never want to do this at the first of the cruise. <laughs> People are wondering, oh, what's going to happen now? So it, it does make a difference as the timing of when we do this show. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Kavanaugh, you had a question. Yes, sir. Oh, this is. <laughs> oh, this is Kavanaugh. Sorry. Um, this leads to my question. I had never heard of a rogue wave before until my sister said, oh, they encountered one outside Barcelona in the Mediterranean back about 212 or 213. I, you know, I don't think it was really a rogue wave after listening to this program, but who uh, keeps track of them? Who, um, and who reports them? I mean, we've never heard of them. Good question. And what they'll do is the, the navigational bridge, this is where the captain or there, there's always a master of the vessel who is a fully licensed captain. And then there is a staff captain. He is fully licensed as well, but there's only one master. He's a captain as well. So they got the second guy. And then there's the officer of the watch and the staff that's up there actually moving the ship. So when I go up there to do commentary from the bridge, I see these guys and I ask them that same question. I said, if you see something, he said, the officer of the watch will record what's happening. And they have you know, live uh, video of everything that goes on up there so they can go back and research, see what happened when it's in time video. Um, if there is a rogue wave that they get hit with, it'll be recorded with the power, the speed of that wave, when it hit them, the exact timing, and what, if any, damage occurred to the ship. So you might have either if the captain, the master was there or the staff captain or the officer of the watch. They have 24 hours, you know, someone up there all the time. And the way they measure it in height is they triangulate it. The guy's looking at it and his scopes, all of his different bits of electronic wizardry they'll have, they'll see the, the crest of the wave, the high point of the wave, and they see the trough, the low point. And that's what the guy did in, uh, in the Philippines that showed you that Ramapo that was hit. They measured 112 feet between the crest and the trough of that wave. So the answer to the question is who is the officer of the watch at the time? Sometimes the captain's there, sometimes he's not. Sometimes the staff captain may be there, sometimes he's not. But there will be a fully licensed officer of the watch on duty all 24 hours. Is there any organization that keeps track of these? In other words, all the information is funneled into an organization. One, let me show you again here. That Max Wave project is the one that I've found that, that's uh, been so interesting. Uh, and it's the man, let's see if uh, we've got that here. Yeah, his name was Rosenthal. Max Rosenthal of the Max Wave project is the one who came up with this idea of um, studying these waves, recording these waves, a number of them, and there's the graphic there. Max, his name was Wolfgang Rosenthal, the Max Wave Project. He's a senior scientist, and they keep a pretty good record of merchant vessels, uh, naval vessels, whatever, who are recording different phenomena out on the ocean. They're studying them to see how frequent they are, um, where they are, <laughs> times, of day, times of year, all that figures into that. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? Mrs. Greenberger? No? <laughs> uh, let's see. Anybody, uh, has anybody here been on a cruise so far? Has anybody taken a trip? Mr. Robinson has. Not yet. 
And not yet. So is anybody planning on taking a cruise? Not after seeing this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lee, this can scare me away. I just want to wait till we're safe from COVID. Well, that's yeah. a good question. And I just got back from seven weeks on a ship. They're just now starting back. They began in July out of the Caribbean. They're operating now out of Florida. They're operating out of um, Seattle, going to Alaska. They're finishing the season there. And we were turning the lights off as we were leaving the Mediterranean. All the ships operating there for the summer are now coming back. Yeah, ours was heading to Miami, and I'll pick it up uh, in Miami on December the 21st to do a canal crossing. And what they have in place are these health and safety protocols on all of these ships. It varies by country. The United States, with the Center for Disease Control, had kept it shut down here a lot longer than in other places. They were operating down in the Caribbean out of uh, Bridgetown, Barbados. They're operating out of Greece, out of Piraeus, out of Rome, and out of Barcelona. So ours, were, the ship I was on, was headquartered in, um, in Greece for the summer. And we were over there for seven weeks back and forth in the Greek islands, going to Rome, going to Barcelona. Uh, what they require is all crew and all staff and all guests to be fully vaccinated to get on board. They also require an antigen test that you showed negative 72 hours prior. And then when you board the vessel, you'll have another test that you pass that will show that you are COVID negative. And then once each week while on the course of the cruise, all the crew, all the staff, and all the guests will be uh, tested as well. We and, then, tested. and then when you disembark the vessel, when you're ready to fly home, you have to show that to your airline and you have to show it when we entered, like we came into um, the, the port hours was in Atlanta. We flew into Atlanta from Barcelona. So you have to show that you were uh, tested and you tested negative just before boarding the plane. In the airports and on the airplane, the entire time you're there, you'll be wearing a mask. And that's uncomfortable for a lot of people if you're flying overnight 10, 12 hours to, to you know, wearing the mask the whole time. But that's the regulations that uh, you know, are on the airlines now. If you're gonna fly, you're gonna wear the mask. We don't see it changing uh, anytime in the very near future. The ships still want to make sure that you're comfortable coming on board. And a lot of people told me that they felt more comfortable on a cruise ship with the health and safety protocols and the constant cleaning. I mean, they are spotless with uh, what's taking place on the ships. Um, and, and the airlines too, you know, making clear, very sure that they're operating the safest yeah. environment. Yeah. Yeah. Still happens, you'll still have people who test positive here and there, uh, and it's just going to happen. But people are so anxious to get back traveling, mm -hmm. interacting with other people. One lady was coming on the ship, she said, I don't care where you're going, I'm ready to go. She said, I just, we've been 18 months, we've been sitting. Um, I guess my question isn't, my concern isn't so much for the ships because I know they're in the aircraft. It's like the ports that you land in, if we end up going, and then taking these little side trips on a bus into the into the country. Yes, that's different. Yeah, that's different because that what happens there is each port, each country has their own individual rules for who can get off the ship and what you have to have. In Greece, anybody can get off. You can go on a short excursion, or you can go in a taverna and have a lunch. You can go in the afternoon, go shopping. You can just wander around the different places where you want. When we got to Italy. They had what they've been having in the Caribbean all summer, bubble excursions. You don't get off the ship on your own. You only get off on an organized shore excursion that the ship offers. Well, a lot of people say, I don't want that. I'm going to be seven, eight, 10 days on a ship and I can't get off in these ports. Only in, in Italy did we have that. In France, uh, we went to Rouen in France, the port. We went to the ports in uh, Spain and all the ports in Greece. You could get off. But Italy is having a spike in the numbers. So what they decided was you're only coming ashore on an organized shore excursion. So people were either booking shore excursion or they were enjoying the ship. Now the Italians were very much opposed to that too because they have to have a vaccination passport. Anytime you're gonna go into a restaurant or into a movie theater or go into a place to shop, you're gonna show your passport that shows you were vaccinated. Even though you live in Rome, they had riots in Rome with water cannon and tear gas because people are so upset about that passport type of a situation. Same in New York City, there have been you know, passports up there to go into different places. 
So it's a, it's a lot of, and those are, like I said, individual calls by the different ports. Some of the Caribbean ports will allow you to come ashore. Others are allow only a bubble excursion. That's interesting. Interesting, thank you. You're welcome. I think about it. <laughs> well, it's like I said, a few uh, months away from being back to what it was. And during this 18 months, you know, a lot of cruise lines went out of business. Other tour operators went out of business. Businesses closed down. It's been a, a unprecedented time for the travel industry. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Well, I yeah. can't wait to see you. Um, yes, Mr. Levy. Yeah, we were on a cruise beginning of October in the Mediterranean. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. In the Mediterranean on a hiking cruise, um, we started in Malta. And uh, we had to do a lot of paperwork to get into Malta. But um, on the ship, every day, a PCR spit test they did every day for every person, and they did it for the crew. Um, at the end, they gave you the results for the United States. And they said during the entire of the 11 days, no one tested positive, so either the crew or passengers. Um, but on the Dalmatian coast, uh, we could go ashore either on a floor or by ourselves um, in both Montenegro and Croatia. A lot of mask wearing, but not as much as here in the United States. Yeah, they were they were asking for masks, people who were going ashore, if they were going to go inside. Any right. public transportation or bus or train or subway, or if you're going into a place to shop, they ask you to put the mask on. Uh, when you're wandering around outside, you probably didn't wear a mask and it didn't have no. to. Wear the same way no, they didn't outside. Yeah, it was only outside. And Valletta was going to be one of our ports of call uh, on the way across uh, coming to Barcelona from home, but they canceled it. They canceled about four different ports along the way. Sometimes it'd be because it had uh, positive tests. So we didn't get to go into Valletta, uh, which is a great port. Uh, uh, yeah, just, uh, loved uh, it. Malta, yeah. Well, I've thrown a lot at you here in our last hour together, but I hope it's been enjoyable for you. Hope it uh, got you ready for Halloween with the different uh, little goats and goblins that we're seeing. And something to think about. Again, these are questions that we can't answer, and we just don't like unanswered questions today. Oh, oh so Nikki, tell them, um, unfortunately, you're not able to come in person in November, but um, we chose a topic, the uh, 21st century in Cuba. So do you want to give them a little sneak peek on that? Yeah. It's November the 16th, I have us down, right, Tammy? Is that what you've got? I think it's yes, the, the same time. Yes. The 16th. I think I, don't, I think I have to keep the time at seven, even though I want to have it at eight, but I think we're going to have to keep it because it's already published. Whatever works for you, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Uh, I'm an hour uh, behind you anyway. We're on Central Time here in Birmingham. Okay. But yeah, we'll be taking you to Cuba. Uh, I've made three trips down there, carrying groups down for the Eisenhower Foundation. Um, Mary Jean Eisenhower, the president's granddaughter, has put together a number of tours. We met the King of uh, Jordan. We went to Egypt and met the First Lady of Egypt, go to Vietnam, Cambodia, different places around the world. And during the Obama administration, when they were loosening the restrictions on travel to Cuba, uh, we made three trips down there. And it's just amazing to see what Cuba is doing today, uh, where they are. And still now it's become more restrictive to travel there as it was. They called it the Havana Syndrome. Um, they don't know if they were bombarding the, the embassy there with the microwaves or whatever, but a lot of people were sickened. So they pretty much clamped down on how easy it was to go to Cuba before, but it is an incredible destination. Uh, we'll be looking at what's happening today, how it developed over there from the Castro era and what is taking place. It's just really remarkable. Even a new currency that they've got before, Yankee dollars and then the Cuban peso and, and now what's, what's happening. But be interesting to uh, to share that with you and see that Cuba has become a very popular destination. It's always been popular with the uh, Europeans because only the United States and Israel were abiding by this embargo that President Kennedy slapped on in 1963. So we went the first time uh, to Cuba. We saw that the people were still gathering up U.S. dollars. Well, the last time we went, it's with the new currency. So a lot of change taking place with their new president. This is the first guy who doesn't have a last name of Castro. Uh, it was Fidel and then his uh, Raul was in and now the new president. 
and um, they've got uh, quite a quite a story to tell. I think you'll enjoy looking at what Cuba is today. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to stop the recording, everybody. I forgot. Uh